Okay, um, good evening. The Parsha this week is the Parsha of Lech Lecha, the third portion of the Torah. And the title of this class is Connecting with Avraham and His Uniqueness, or Understanding Avraham and His Uniqueness. Which is, a, and we're going to try to create a thread or an arc here, but I want to begin with something a little unusual. Um, my wife, in preparing for her classes, um, showed me an article written by Emanuel Feldman in March 1995, 26 years ago. And I'm going to read an excerpt of that just because I think it's very enlightening for me. And I think it could be enlightening for all of us in terms of setting the picture of what we want to look at tonight. Reads as follows. It's called A Death in Jerusalem by Rabbi Emanuel Feldman, 1995. It was probably the single largest assemblage of Jews in Jerusalem since the destruction of the Second Temple 19 centuries ago. He's reporting on this. Even in a city accustomed to extraordinary events, it was remarkable. Over 300,000 people gathered for a funeral, not of a head of state or a famous public figure. They had come to honor the life of Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach, who was universally recognized as one of the premier poskim halachic decisors of his generation, and who had just died at the age of 85. For almost two hours, they stood silently in the streets and lanes around his house, weeping as they listened over loudspeakers to the eulogies, after which they followed the beer on foot in a three hour funeral procession to the cemetery. It was a sight staggering. Every inch of every street and byway in central Jerusalem was tightly packed with men, women, and children. Balconies were crammed. Young boys gazed down from rooftops. Traffic was at a standstill for hours. Helicopters hovered overhead. Police stood at attention in every intersection. And by the way, I Googled this funeral and I found a newscast from a totally secular, it was like a news bulletin with footage from a helicopter saying that the entire city of Jerusalem was shut down for hours today as the funeral of Rabbi Shlomo Zaman Orbach took place. And they had video footage of literally black seas of people covering the whole city. To continue what he wrote, here was a man who shunned all publicity, had no official titles, never granted media interviews, had no PR office, issued no bulletins or journals, assiduously discouraged any view of himself that might tend to ascribe anything but ordinary human abilities to himself. It was not even mentioned in Jewish encyclopedias, had never left the borders of the Holy Land, and yet the myriads of Jews around the world felt so intimately connected to him that hundreds of thousands spontaneously flocked to pay him a last tribute on just a few hours notice. And here's the part that I wanna highlight, just a couple more sentences. Clearly it was more than prodigious scholarship that was being honored here. It was what lay beyond that learning. The people were responding to qualities which have grown increasingly rare, genuineness, wholeness, straightforwardness, impeccable integrity, what our tradition calls an ish emet, a person of truth. What touched them was an awareness that not only were his halachic rulings avidly sought out and followed, but that his quiet, self-effacing man was the embodiment of this truth. That the multitudes identified with Anish Emet was a tribute not only to the man, it was a tribute to the people themselves who, in an age of untruth, demonstrated that the instinctive yearning for this ideal is still inextinguished. And he concludes, for this is the definition of a godol, a great person, often overtaxed in Judaism, 
Akaro is not elected or appointed. He becomes, by virtue of his transcending knowledge, understanding, and sensitivity to God, Torah, and the Jewish people, Kal Yisrael, we the Jewish people instinctively respond to this resonating echo that comes from within him. Why do I read that? You know, it's, it's just interesting because we live at a time where it's not unusual to ask people, how many followers do you have? <laughs> <laughs> and when we think about that, you know, you mean on Facebook, on Instagram, on this, on TikTok, um, how many people do you feel you influence? How many people do you impact? How many people do you communicate? And we know that people spend immense amount of energy and focus and, and reading every article they possibly can get. How do I increase my following? And I always marveled about something. And I think to some extent, this account of the funeral of Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach capture something there. Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky says, he writes that, I guess that the majority of the world's population was impacted by Avraham's teaching. That's a statement he makes. So here we have to go back past 1995, 26 years ago, before the age of Facebook and internet and all that stuff. But you go back to the time of Abraham and you read something like that and you think to yourself, that's ridiculous. How could a person have such an influence on the majority of people in the world? And then you read about Abraham's life and his travels and what he did all day. And like, like Rabbi Feldman alludes to, he wasn't holding press conferences. He didn't arrive in a limousine with an entourage. He just traveled and communicated and interacted. And he impacted the course of the world. And I used to say, I used to hold up a co copy of the National Geographic from circa 1990, which had Abraham on the cover. And it said, Abraham, the father of three faiths. But today I don't have to do that anymore. We can talk about the Abraham Accords, which are transforming the political thinking about the whole Middle East. And it's called the Abraham Accords. It's such an interesting thing. And it's so fitting when you think about what Rabbi Feldman writes about here, this mystical sense of people attaching themselves to a person as an example of truth, greatness, kindness, all the things that pull at our hearts. So that's why I wanted to think about this idea of let's understand Avraham better. And, and we I, there's many, many different arcs to follow. But I want to try to follow one here tonight. Yes. Rabbi, can I just make a point that tomorrow in Jerusalem at the new museum that um, uh, Larry Mizell is uh, um, been instrumental in developing the representatives of all the countries of the Abraham Accords are meeting. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, for a dinner. And uh, it's quite something. So just sorry. Just no, no, it, it really is. We are living in history. No, we are. And, and, and it harkens back to me when, you know, at the um, Holocaust Memorial Day, when Rabbi Lau stood on the stage and the heads of state of I don't know how many countries, including the, the main perpetrators of the Holocaust, stood to recognize the day as being a day of great importance. You know, the, these are, it is, it is. And yet at the same time, I think what Rabbi Feldman wrote 26 years ago about truth seeming to disappear from the consciousness of people, that also seems to be happening to a greater extent. So I want to try to describe an arc here, and, and I'm going to source it out step by step, and we'll see if it, if it holds together. First of all, in terms of this week's Torah reading, chapter 17, sentence one, which is the last chapter in the Parsha of Lech Lecha, 
it starts off where God commands Avram to circumcise himself and his household. And God says, Walk before me and become upright, complete, whole. The word tamim is something we talked about several weeks ago when it was used in the context of a commandment to the Jewish people. Not easy to define. And if I forget to come back and give us a better definition a little bit later, you'll remind me, please. Just what struck me was Abraham was 99 years old. He already spent a few decades living in an intense household in the land of Canaan, offering, making offerings to God, sacrifices, interacting with the people, interacting with Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, fighting a war against ruling kings, all kinds of pretty amazing, but yet day-to-day -day things that a person can involve themselves in. And now God comes to him and says, walk before me and become the tamim, and become upright. What was jarring to me about that phrase is when you turn back to last week's Parsha of Noah, Noah is described off the bat as tzaddik kaya tzaddik, I have the sentence in front of me, but he described as tzaddik tamim bidoroso, he was already complete. So there's a tremendous sense of irony here. Noah, who is not the founder of the Jewish people, he is our progenitor, because he's the progenitor of all human beings who survived the flood. In the very beginning, God declares that he's tamim, he's upright already. And yet with Avraham, after all these episodes and events and all this time, and God comes to him and presents him with a commandment and offers him a covenant, a brit, a connection that will last through all generations, God tells him, become Tamim. You've got a ways to go. <laughs> the, the, the score is not settled. The, the the appellation does not yet apply to you, but it's something you could work towards. That was very striking to me. Well, that, uh, uh, Rabbi, could I uh, ask a question here? Please. Did, in in Parsha Noah, didn't it say um, that he was upright for his generation, which is a pretty significant uh, uh, Limitation. Uh, caveat? Yeah. Right. Well, it could be a caveat. It could not be, perhaps. You know, some people say it magnifies his greatness. But the fact is, God just declares him as Tamim. You know, and, and, and I'm, I'm not sure how much of this we'll discuss, but Noah, in later episodes, in two very distinct ways, which we will talk about then, falls short. So if he already was upright, to whatever extent he was, it didn't seem to follow through throughout the course of his life. I mean, I think there's something grand about the notion that when we begin to get to know Avram, and when God begins to interact with Avram intensively, not just saying, go forth from your homeland, and not just interacting with people, but saying, walk with me and become Tamim. It's a big statement in terms of what these qualities are all about and, and, and why we respond why the world responded to an Avraham, why we today carry forward the faith and religion and, and the, the, the circumcision of Avraham, we carry it forward yet today, and yet we don't feel that same reach back to Noah in a specific way where we feel as though he and understanding Noah is going to impact us in the same way that understanding Avraham and then his son Yitzhak, and then his son Yaakov is going to impact our lives. So I want to start a, a, an arc that looks at this. And it begins as follows. In the very beginning of the Torah, when God talks about the seven days of creation, and this is Genesis chapter 2, sentence 3. We read it three weeks ago. We say by, very famously on the seventh day, Vayahu HaShemayim V'Horetz, and God completed the heaven and the earth, and Shabbos came, and the final phrase there in sentence three is Asher Bora Elokim La'asot. 
which is usually translated as which God created. And the word la'asot is sort of left hanging. So I noticed the translation, I showed it to one person I studied with, where he translates this phrase as which God created to perfect. In other words, la'asot means for us to like continue the creation, to continue taking everything that man, that God created and to, and to continue forming it and shaping it and developing it and perfecting it. And you, you can find this translation in the art scroll Sukkot Machser, it's on page 1180. And he bases this translation on a Ramban and I did look into this pretty carefully. And the Ramban says, the word bara is to create from nothing. I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but the word lasot is to take what's there and to make it better. And hence the understanding is that when Shabbos came and God stopped creating and the world was complete and Adam and Eve were in the world already, the, chart, the concept was God saying, I've created this universe, multiverse, everything I've created, now perfect it develop it, continue to shape it. That's the way we start off this process, this looking forward, this sense that things are not done yet and we have a role to play. So that's the foundational principle I wanna put out there. And again, this contrasts with God describing Noah as being Tamim, being upright, and telling Avraham, become upright. I'm not here to honor you with an accolade, which then you could debate whether it's only in his generation or in all generations, if he was alive when Avraham was alive, would he have been greater, would he have been better, blah, 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 all the things that people discuss rightfully. But instead, it's I'm not here to offer you an appellation, but I'm here to clarify a path and direction forward. He tarech lefanai, walk before me, make progress, keep going, and become upright. A big difference. And I want to use this as the basis for everything. And we have a medrash. It happens to be quoted in the book, Mesilat Yesharim at length. I did look up the whole medrash. Um, and the medrash is on a sentence in Ecclesiastes chapter seven, sentence 13, which reads, look at God's work for who can straighten what has been twisted. And the Medrash says, when the Holy One, blessed be he, created the first human, Adam, he took him and led him around all the trees of the garden of Eden and instructed him, look at my works, how beautiful and praiseworthy they are. And all that I have created, it was for you that I created it. Pay attention that you do not corrupt and destroy my world. If you corrupt it, there is no one to repair it after you. That's the full Medrash. And the point of the Mesilat Yesharim, the guide to the just is making, is number one, the universe was clearly created to benefit man, to support our growth and our progress and our development. And number two, that in our hands is the opportunity to elevate or to ruin all that was created. And that's what that... That's why that sentence in Ecclesiastes and Kohelet is so strong. Who is it that can straighten out that which has been twisted? And obviously, all that applies to us as people. And I think that's the idea, the phrase like tikkun olam, to repair the world. It's really based on that sentence in, in Kohelet that we have the opportunity to elevate the world and we can elevate the world from wherever point we find it. If it's in a low state, we can untwist that which has been twisted and straighten it out. And if it's an elevated state, we can build upon that and we can go further and further up the chain and continue to make 
the world more perfect. Let's now introduce an idea about, so this is the ark, and this is Adam's life. And, and, and Adam, even after being kicked out of Gan Eden for damaging the world, he was instructed, guard it, protect it, work it, develop it. It's not gonna cooperate particularly well with you. You'll have your challenges. It'll require the sweat of your brow but you will be able to sustain mankind through your efforts in the world. And if you make the attempt, you can untwist that which has been twisted and you could elevate the entire world and its creation through your actions, through what you undertake to do, through what you undertake to accomplish. We're gonna continue this arc on to Noah. Famous question, the most famous question in the world is, what's the difference between Noah and Avraham? And there's a, many, many different answers proposed. Noah is perplexing in the following way. Noah clearly saved humanity. Okay, so let's give him credit where credit is due. God looked out at the world and said there are however many millions of people, billions of people, I have no idea were in the world after 10 generations in the year 1656 after creation. And God said, I have no choice but to wipe them out, but here's Noah and he stands out in his righteousness and in the fact that he's Tomim and therefore I will rescue him and I will rebuild the world through him. What happens along the way? I'm going to point out three incidents. Let's discuss them. Number one, in a strange comment that Rashi makes, Noah builds this ark for 120 years. He's derided by all the people. You're a lunatic. You're out of your mind. God's not destroying the world. There's no reason for us to join you in building it or to help you build it. The rain starts to fall. And the Torah notes that Noah gets onto the ark because of the waters and, and Rashi paints a picture and through the Medrash that he stood there and the waters were a foot deep and they were two feet deep and they were three feet deep and they were four feet deep. And finally Noah said, well, I guess I may as well get on the ark now in the face of these waters as opposed to what you would have expected as well. I've been working 120 years to build this ark, man. God told me it's going to rain and flood and everybody's not going to make it except for me. The first time, every to me, every time it, a drop of rain <laughs> fell, I would have been grabbing my umbrella, standing by the door of the ark and saying, is it time? Is it time? Should I get on? So I closed the door, but apparently Noah was Mikitani Amuna. That's the way Rashi quotes the Midrash. He didn't, he, he was conflicted. And, and, and Rashi explains one way, we're gonna look at a source that explains a different way. The next thing we encounter with Noah is the question, Noah seemingly did not pray on behalf of the people when he heard that the world was gonna be destroyed and seek to save them. Okay, so is that a question on Noah? Well, um, it could be, and maybe it's not, but we're gonna to try to look at this for a moment. God comes to Noah and says, okay, the jig is up. There's no good left in the world. There's no potential for people to repent, to find their way, to untwist that which is twisted, and they keep twisting it more and more. I'm going to have to put the re push the reset button. <clears throat> but you I'm saving because through you I could rebuild mankind with hope and with expectation that the world will fulfill its purpose. So for Noah then to turn around, as we know Abraham did at a certain point, and say, look, God, don't be so hasty. Maybe everybody should be spared. That seemingly is missing from the narrative. You know, when after the sin of the golden calf, while they're all worshiping, God turns to Moshe and says, that's it, I've had it with the Jewish people. Moshe says, oh, if you've had it with them, I'm out. You know, just wipe me out. So we see that there's a quality of praying on behalf of someone, even if their evil is recognized and established. And even if God's anger 
seems to be perfectly justified and calibrated, there's still room for a person to pray. Why didn't Noah pray? And the third issue is when Noah comes off the ark after the flood and Noah succumbs to drink and becomes drunk and a tragedy evolves from that. What was going on there? So to connect these three dots, I'm quoting something that Rabbi Friend quoted in the name of, of the Sefer Kedusha Slevi by Rev. Levi Yitzhak Berditcher, the Hasidic viewpoint on the Torah, which I wouldn't have seen either without someone pointing it out to me, and I thank them, that Noah's lack of faith and strength was his lack of belief in himself. Now, let's take a minute and understand what that could mean. Perhaps what it means, and this is where I want to connect it back to the first sources, perhaps the clearest way to understand this approach is as follows. Noah, let's have a talk. God created this whole universe, galaxies and everything we know about it today. Giant telescopes can't even begin to penetrate it. So many mysteries. Created it all for the sake of one person, you, Adam. And I'm putting the keys to the kingdom in your hand. And as we said, it's up to you to make it worthwhile, to build upon it and to keep it straight or to twist it and corrupt it, it's all up to you. Do your best. And I'm, I, I'm in your corner, but you're gonna have to choose what you do. That's the scenario. So Adam, even when he sinned and ate from the tree that he wasn't supposed to eat from, and even when he saw himself out of the Garden of Eden, Noah does, uh, Adam does live for 930 years. Noah spent the rest of his life untwisting that which he saw twisted, doing his best to fulfill this mandate to, to take those keys that were still in his hand, even though he was out of the Garden of Eden, and to use those keys for the good. And he saw that responsibility upon him as a human being, and that's what the name human being meant. So even though there maybe became millions of people in the world, Adam still saw he was grounded in those instructions that God gave him, and we can assume he gave these instructions to others. People abandoned that job. We talked a little bit last week about the builders of the tower making war on God. Their goal was to eliminate God from the world. Instead of living in God's world in service and in consonance with God's goals, they said, we want to live in a world where there's no God, where there's no accountability, where there's no sense of obligation to a being greater than ourselves. So we're going to build a tower so we can make war, we can eliminate the consciousness of God. We discussed that a little bit at the end of last week's class. Noah clearly did not buy into those ideologies. But perhaps what Levi Yitzhakar Bidichev is explaining is that when God came to Noah and said, okay, the jig is up, 120 years, start building your ark. Noah didn't start praying, because Noah said, well, who am I? I'm just a guy. Yeah, I'm a good guy. I'm living the way God likes. He gave me this sign that says, Tumim, Tzadik, Tumim, maybe with a caveat, maybe without a caveat, depending on which opinion of Rashi you like. But he stamped me with the idea that I am unique in the world. So I'm not going to argue with God about the rest of the people. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to build this ark. And of course, when people came by and asked them, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm doing it because it's going to be a flood. The world's going to be destroyed. God's not happy with the way we're living. And for 120 years, he answered questions and explained himself to people. And people scoffed and mocked and pushed him aside the way people tend to do when people stand out in righteousness. All that happened. But perhaps Noah didn't see himself as really holding the keys to the kingdom in his own hands, had he been felt more that way, he would have prayed on behalf of the other people. He would have been quick to get into the ark the minute his shoes got wet, because he would have realized that I want to live a life in consonance with building up the world the way God intended, and if God really has decided to wipe everybody out but me, so I need to jump onto this ark so that I can 
wait out the flood there with my family and we can rebuild the world together on a more solid footing. And then after the flood, when Noah comes back to a world devoid of humanity and realizes what it means, it's just me and my wife and my three kids and their wives, that's all that's left. If he would have seen, if he would have been so grounded and okay, it's a restart, it's a chance for us to continue untwisting that which has been twisted and begin really repairing a world so mankind could re-enter the Garden of Eden or whatever God has in store for us, he wouldn't have been prone to intoxication because he would have been focused on such a lofty mission that he wouldn't have been dissuaded by the grapes that he had planted and seeing that the world is renewing and that tragedy wouldn't have happened either. So then we come to Avraham. I want to add this thought as an explanation of understanding Avraham in these terms. Avraham was born into a world where there was no awareness of God around him. There was still people in the world who were aware of God. We encounter Malchizedek, the king of Shalem, and he right away talks about God. So there were other people, but they weren't in Avraham's orbit. And Avraham discovers God. We know that. Other people knew about God. But the uniqueness of Avraham, I want to say, in this prism of understanding is that Avraham understood, okay, I'm only one guy. And then he got married, and it was him and his righteous wife, Sarah, two people. And he was convinced through and through that he could impact the entire world, because that's what man's mission is. And he didn't have to impact the world by buying Google ads. He had to impact the world by embodying all the great attributes that he understood that God has. And that's really how his belief in God impacted him. I see a God who's compassionate. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of brutality in the world. There's a lot of murder in the world. There are a lot of terrible things happening. But I see that God created the world for man's benefit. I see that God gave the keys to the kingdom to human beings. And as it says in Pirkei but he looked around and said, okay, nobody else wants to take these keys and sit in the driver's seat and start the motor and take responsibility for improving the world. But the fact that no one else will do it means I just have to do it that much better and with that much more conviction. So Avraham reached back to the very instructions that God gave to Adam and said, the world is ours to be perfected, to be completed, to be shaped, to be untwisted, to do a to repair it to bring it up to its ultimate purpose and meaning. Avram was imbued with that idea. Well, his wife would say to him perhaps, and I'm sure she was supportive to the nth degree, but there's only two of us. And Avram could say, so what? How many, who, why do you think it takes more than that? And, and, and let's see what we can do. And someone like Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky could imagine that two such people could influence the majority of the world's population for the good, to give them an awareness of God. And as I've quoted several times, we'll see it in two weeks, the quote from Rashi, that when Avram is going to send Eliezer out to find a wife for his son Yitzhak, and we don't read that for another two weeks, he says, he refers to God as a okay Hashemayim the okay hearts. God is the God of the heavens and the God of the earth. Unlike when I started, when when Sora and I started out, he was only the El Kashimam. He was just like the people in Bavel intended. He was limited to up there. God was locked out, you know, and um, and, and and the world was free of him. He's only the the, the, the God of the heavens. And but I, I got to know him and I got to understand him. And then I got to realize that God could have impact and involvement in the awareness of human beings and change the course of human history and human life. And that conviction led him to listen for God's message, 
to travel to the land of Canaan, to face the challenges that he's that the ten tests that he and that he and his family had to go through, undaunted, undaunted. Why? Because he knows that that's what people do. That's why people are. That's what we're here for. And 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 hence, in next week's Torah reading, when he hears about the destruction of the people of Sodom, he starts praying for them. Now, can't pray for them and say, "Well, God, just what's the difference if people are good or bad?" That's not the kind of praying that Avram did. Avram said, "Maybe there are fifty righteous people. You know, fifty righteous people they could have an impact. The people could all turn around. Maybe there are 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. You know, there's still hope." for regenerating the goodness in all these people. And when I think this through, I am so brought back to the words that Rabbi Feldman wrote in 1995, when he happened to be in Jerusalem on the day that Rabbi Shlomo Zaman Orbach died, when he happened to be part of those throngs of 300,000 people honoring him. And he wonders, what are they responding to? What, did, what do they see? What do they hear? And he has this conclusion, you know, that, that, that an ish emet, a truth, a person permeated by truth, who is upright, who is permeated with goodness, concern for other people, interest in helping others, interest in carrying forward all the traditions of the Torah, such a man elicits a response within fellow human beings to the extent that, as he says, it was probably the single largest assemblage of Jews in Jerusalem since the destruction of the Second Temple 19 centuries ago. This is to see how, how Rabbi Feldman's response and reaction to seeing people come out to honor, as he writes, not a head of state, not a, a person of great wealth, not a person who, who has invented the cure for a disease. And God bless the people who invent cures for disease, don't get me wrong. But <clears throat> rather it's a person whom people can't help but be influenced by because he was a person with his smile and his warmth and his erudition and his love and his concern and his truth. People of all stripes, all backgrounds responded to him. And I think, I think a person like Rabbi Feldman could only react this way and could only characterize that funeral this way, built upon this understanding of what does it mean to collect followers and be a person of influence? What enables a person to do so? And I want to add something else. What enables a person to become so great? After all, thousands study Torah, and as it says in, I think, in the sentence, a thousand, a thousand come into the Beit Midrash, and only, and only one emerges. So how, do you, how does the world produce a Shlomo Zalman Orbach in 1995, and, and he's such a rare gem of a person. And part of the answer is because he saw himself as capable of changing the world. He saw himself as responsible to change the world. He saw himself in light of, if, to the extent that I study Torah and I perfect my character, and I and I and I look back at the sentence in, in Genesis chapter 17, sentence one, to the extent that he I see myself walking before God with a purpose in mind and with a mission in mind. And to the extent that I continue on the path of the Heye Tamim, I continue on the path of becoming upright, becoming complete, growing, seeking. And seeking ultimately yearning, and this, I want to just say this: look, yearning for the redemption of mankind, but not just yearning for the redemption of mankind, but feeling a responsibility to bring it about, feeling a responsibility to make it happen. So that when 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 someone like this 
praise in the simplest form, he, he thinks to himself, as we see characterized in Mesil Atisharim in, 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 in chapter 19, he thinks to himself that, God, I'm standing before you and I'm beseeching you to fulfill the redemption of the world. And you say to such a person as, who do you think you are? Are you kidding? You're one guy. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world. Where do you say such a prayer? And yet those prayers are in our mouth. You know, two of the 19 benedictions in the Amida, or, you know, renew the kingdom of, of David, you know, bring, bring about a redemption of the world. Let's complete the task of tikkun olam. And when we're, 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 it's explained to us that don't say to yourself, as Noah perhaps said to himself when he heard that a whole generation was going to die in the flood, okay, you know, God knows what he's doing, and my job is to build the ark. So if, if I want to translate it into this, my job is to be just a big tzaddik and to fulfill being a tomim to the best way I can. And whatever happens with the world, you know, I'm, I'm not going to start up with God about redemption. Those are beyond my pay grade. No, because reach back to the origins that God handed these keys to every single human being, because there was only one and he gave it to one. And if Avraham would have felt that way, even when God said to him, he wanted to leave your homeland, go to the place I will show you, even had he done so, which he did at the age of 75, 24 years later, when God comes back to him and says, it's time to enter into a covenant and for you to circumcise yourself, God says to him, and, and you're getting there. You're along the way. Why did he move along the way when we see Noah seemingly didn't? And why is it appropriate for God to talk to him about becoming Tamim instead of being Tamim? Because that's the vantage point of a person who then looks up to God and says, let's, let's complete the picture here. I'm one person. I'm striving to live within the boundaries that you have set for mankind and to perfect my character and my actions and, and elevate my concern for my fellow man and to do kindness to people to the greatest extent I can. And God, you do your part to rectify the world so that there could be an ultimate sense of harmony and peace and goodness in the world, because that's what it's all about. And even though I'm just one person, and even though it sounds like a chutzpah for me to talk this way to God, I'm relying on the fact that when God talked to the one human being he created, and when, uh, when Avraham, 2,000 years into the world, undertook upon himself that his, he and his household would do everything they can to influence the world, they were doing the right thing. I want to do the same thing. I want to pick up those keys. I want to dr drive the world in the right direction. And I pray to God that I, to maximize the impact that's possible so that the world can become untwisted and so that we can get back to where we all belong to be. And that, I think, is the core conviction that distinguishes Avraham from all others. And that's why we continue to respond to his every action. And that's why a person like Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach should rest in peace, a holy man, in a simple life, living in the neighborhood that he was born into, could attract 300,000 people to a funeral because people felt a connection and they appreciated him and they, they found something in him that they knew the world would miss and something that has to be re-added to the world through our own efforts now that he's passed away. And I think that gives us a sense of Abraham's uniqueness and a way of understanding Abraham that we could really benefit ourselves, benefit our families, benefit our communities, and benefit the world in which we live. Anybody has any questions? I'm happy to try to answer them. Rabbi, it's Rachel. May I say something? Please. Okay. So um, I was reading Rabbi Vigdor Miller this over Shabbat, and he said something interesting. Um, 
because every time there's Parsha Noah, everybody talks about how he didn't follow through, he didn't pray for the people. But he said, look at every animal. Whenever you see an animal in this world, you think to yourself that they would not have existed had it not been for Noah. Right. And even more so, every single person, even I looking at myself in the mirror, would not have existed had it not been for Noah. And he was going into the point how Sadiqim really carry the world, their sacrifices, and so on and so forth. But um, so, so that 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 that's a very beautiful complimentary point, Rochelle, because I'm not saying that Noah was a selfish, uncaring person. Oh no, I didn't mean it in that way. And so right. I agree with everything you said. And everything Victor Miller wrote is a thousand percent true. We wouldn't be here if not for Noah. But right. But but what uh -huh. Noah saw himself as accomplishing everything that that he said that he accomplished. But and again, I, I, who am I to say this? But he, he he if he would have seen himself differently, he would have accomplished more. So here's the question I have: Hashem made us all with a certain nature. And he put us into certain experiences at a certain time in the world to make a point or a difference. And Moshe Rabbeinu was, was not Abraham, you know, Aveno and so on and so forth. Yosef at Sadiq was different. What made them different is who they were and the experiences that they had in their own life and how they responded. And it said clearly in the Torah that Noah walked perfect, like with Hashem in his generations. And to me, it, it seemed like it was saying there should be no doubt that in that time frame, maybe because uh, from what I heard, that the earth went through a spiritual experience with the waters and that the entire world was different after the flood. And maybe that before, and I'm just speculating, I don't know, I'm just asking the question, if maybe you've read this before, maybe it's come up somewhere that um, perhaps before the, there was a difference. People didn't do things like praying. Like that was so far, far fetched that you would be a good person. You'd be lucky if you just could listen to someone. If you even just heard someone out and said, person asked you to do something and, and you helped them out, that was like a big deal. Here he was listening to Hashem and maybe the focus was more on obedience and that was his mission because he's not a he's not Abraham Avinu. He was Noah, and that was his mission, was to, and he gave him that nature. So maybe this depressive type of nature, I mean, I don't know. It's Hashem gave it to him, and so, he so did. All, all you're saying is a thousand percent true. The point of this though is that, and it's not said from a and it's to learn from Abraham, point, right? But but perhaps. If Noah would have expanded his his own horizons, after all, you see, philosophically, Adam being created directly by God, he he was a complete package of greatness. As an individual, he possessed far greater potential than anybody after him because he was created never to die. You know, even physically, he had an endurance that would have lasted, was capable of lasting throughout history. Nobody after him has that. Um, nobody after him was created directly by God. So you're right, everybody has unique potential. But the, the point of this class is for each of us to think about, given the potential we have, and none of us are, can, you know, given the potential we have, let's maximize our aspiration to have lasting and deep and comprehensive impact on the world. Let's look for those opportunities. And you're right, we wouldn't be here without Noah. You know, but but I'm following the paradigm of Pirkei Avot. There were ten generations from mean. Avraham until Noah, till from Adam mm -hmm. until Noah. Okay, those were years of decline. Noah saved the world and kept it going. Then there were ten more generations of decline until Avraham, and that's why Avraham inherited all this merit mm -hmm. and reward. But the the distinction is Avraham uniquely built a lasting impact on the world that you know, when we talk about the Abraham Accords, we talk about, but the most lasting thing is that every time a Jewish boy is circumcised, we're, we're, we're listening to the words that God spoke to Avraham. We're not doing that with any words that were spoken to Noah. We're not doing that with anything that spoke to, to Adam. 
But, and I want to say that the, the reason is the distinguishing point with all the good that everybody, you know, we can do is if we see ourselves as take more responsibility to have an impact on the world, mm -hmm. maximize it. And, you, and, and we'll see within our own look, not that any of us are necessarily destined to be the Mashiach, but we'll see that we'll have a bigger impact and a bigger, a bigger influence on the people around us and on ourselves. Amen. Okay. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you so much. I'm happy to. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Rabbi. Good night.